great moments are born from great opportunity. If you want to be loved as real champions, worthy champions, you're going to have to work and improve and change. The inches we need are everywhere around us. Hell yeah. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. Being perfect is about being able to look your friends in the eye and know that you didn't let them down because you told them the truth. And that truth is, is that you did everything that you could. There wasn't one more thing that you could have done. Can you live in that moment? If you put your effort and concentration into playing to your potential, to be the best that you can be, I don't care what the scoreboard says, at the end of the game, in my book, we're going to be winners. This is your time. The only one who's going to tell me when I'm through doing my thing is you people here. My first year in coaching, um, Wake Forest is playing Duke. Uh, we didn't have a big crowd there, there that day, but something happened that stayed with me forever. Bill Dooley was the coach at Wake Forest, one of the all-time really good guys, wonderful coach, coach at North Carolina, Virginia Tech, and Wake Forest. We're chatting before the game. He puts his hand out and says, Steve, let's hope and pray nobody gets hurt today. And I said, Coach, I'm all for that. So for the rest of my coaching career, when I chatted with a guy before the game. Now, when I was at Florida, I didn't always talk with Coach Fulmer and those other guys. But when I, when I talked to him before the game, I said, Coach, let's hope and pray nobody gets hurt today. Because that's uh, we, 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 mentally, uh, looking back, I wish I had shaken hands with everybody before the game. My wife and I drove up from uh, Morgantown to here and got us a room and everything. And we we're not we're not used to that kind of luxury and uh, and so we check in and go up to our room then we go out to eat and then come back and so my my wife said uh, th this was right after the Watergate you remember Watergate <laughs> my wife said I, I bet you this room's bugged <laughs> you know and uh, she said you know all these big important hotels where where a lot of dignitaries come they bug them. I said, no, Ann, they wouldn't, they wouldn't bug this place, you know. But I got to thinking about it. Well, she went on to bed, and I, I, so I started looking around, you know. I looked over the door sill, I looked under the keyhole, and I looked under the bed and behind the flowers. I searched the room. No, no, it wasn't bugged. Couldn't find anything. Started to go to bed, looked out in the middle of the floor, and there was a rug, little rug out there, a little eight-by-four rug. I said, I bet you something's under that. You know, something is under that. It's too suspicious. So I go over and I pick that rug up, and sure enough, there's a little steel plate, steel plate about that size there with a screw in this end and a screw in that end. So I go get me a dime, <laughs> you know, and I unscrew the screw here, you know, then I unscrew the other screw, then I lift it up and, and, and look it over, and, and there's nothing there. Nothing there, so it ain't bugged, right? So I screw it back in and I go back, and this, and this place ain't bugged. We get up the next morning, go down, check out, when we we're going to check out. And the girl said, uh, was your room okay? Oh, yeah, it was good. Did, did y'all, everything was okay? Oh, yeah, everything was fine. Well, you heard about the people underneath you, didn't you? No. Chandelier fell on them. You know? <laughs> It is not often you have a chance to talk to legends, especially getting legends together and those who have been involved in chandeliers in hotel rooms and handshakes after games. We're going to do that here today in a very rare and a very special episode of The Man in the Arena. Hi, once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner. Thanks so much for joining us. I have been fortunate in my career to cover some of the greats and great games, the eras I grew up in, the time when I got started, when I first became a sportscaster. I was in Florida at a time when college football was king. Think about that for a moment. Yeah, there was the Miami Dolphins in the early 70s. But when I was covering sports, it was Florida, Florida State, Miami. These were the powers. 
and these were organizations and programs led by legends. And we have a chance to talk to those two legends whom you just heard, who were in both inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame and have a wealth of stories to tell. I'm really not going to have to do a whole lot of introduction here because, quite frankly, you'll know who they are. Tallahassee may be the state capital of Florida, but it is the capital of football to many people, those who follow the Seminoles at Florida State and who have for years. He was there, and he has great stories to tell. And one of these days, I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to ask him if he ever really said Dad Gummit over and over again, because I swear he said it to me a couple of times in some interviews. The former head coach of the Florida State Seminoles and a member of the College Football Hall of Fame, it is a pleasure to welcome Bobby Bowden into the man in the arena. Coach, good to see you. Hey, good to see you, boy. Uh, there it is. That's See, that's that's right there. I'm telling you, it's Bobby Bowden as always. How you doing, boy? How you doing, boy? It was just, it's it's those moments that I remember, and we're going to get into them here today in just a couple of moments. Uh, you also heard there, when it comes down to the College Football Hall of Fame, the other gentleman who took a program in Gainesville, Florida, and made it a national powerhouse, which it is to this day. He is legendary there for what he did, and he brought an esprit de corps to Gainesville. It, it's, it's amazing when you talk to people who are members of the University of Florida, those who graduated there, the compassion that they have for what he brought and the college football Saturdays that he brought together. It is a pleasure to welcome the former head coach of the University of Florida and a member of the College Football Hall of Fame. I like saying that. Steve Spurrier joins us on The Man in the Arena. Coach, good to see you. Hey, Ed, good to be with you today. Good to see it, you again, Coach Bowden. Ah, see there, and see, and there it is. It's, it's one of those great moments you get to bring everybody together here. That's what makes this show so very special. Gentlemen, I, I, I introduced you both and I used a word. And it is, it, some people throw out the phrase GOAT these days to a lot of players, greatest of all time. And they always look at, at what's happening current. They never look back over great players when they consider GOATs. For the two of you, I use the words legend. And you are, and you certainly realize that. So, Coach Bowden, let me start with you. When I say to you the word legend, what does that mean to you when people call you a legend? It, it means you're at the top of the class. I mean, that don't mean you're number one, but uh, if you're a legend, you're one of them. And when, but when it says legend, are you, does it, for some people, they don't want to be called a legend. They feel uncomfortable being called that. Are you comfortable with that at this stage in your life? That'd be some of the things I was called. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I can't argue with that at all, knowing full well what, what somebody probably said. Coach Sperry, let me get to you then. Legend. You are indeed a legend. Are you comfortable with that? I really don't take it to heart. I don't pay a lot of attention to it, but I guess it is uh, nice to hear, and it does mean that maybe you did whatever you do in life a little bit exceptionally better than most people. And uh, I think any profession, whatever we try to do in life, we would like to be considered one of the best. Not necessarily the best, but, you know, one of the best to, to do what you do in life. So I, I guess it's nice, but I really don't have a whole lot of attention to it. Gentlemen, is it not fair to say that if you are going to become uh, a legend, and if you're going to be considered that, that you have to surround yourself with really great people? That's all part of it, because whether it's politics, sports, entertainment, to the people that I've had the opportunity to interview over the years, they will always spend time talking about the people that they brought in and the people that they surrounded themselves with. Coach Sperrier, what about those people that you surrounded yourself with and, and the selection process that you went through and how important it was to get the right people that would understand what you were trying to do? And I think one of the first steps to be successful anytime you're on a team, company, or whatever, is you have to assemble the people to help you be successful. And uh, as a coach, that means your coaching staff, and then obviously recruiting the players and so forth, and uh, everyone that's involved with the team. So uh, 
And then as you go through year after year, your senior leadership, I think, is extremely important. I've heard so many, uh, really, I've so many coaches say uh, the tradition that we built here will carry on from one group to the next year and down the line. And when I look at my years here at Florida, 12 of them, Coach Bowden had a lot more than I did. But uh, the older guys sort of told the younger guys, here's how we do it now. And here's how we prepare and through the summer and through the season and through the season. And then it would carry, you know, year after year. After year. So, uh, those people that have had continued success, they have the ability to train the people, especially your players in football, to teach the younger guys that they come through the season. The, the teamwork. Coach Bowden, let me ask you then, that comes down again to the people that you surround yourself with. How difficult is it from the coach's perspective? Because not just your assistants, but with the players you surround yourself with, the recruiting process that, that you go through. How difficult is it to, you've got to look into the eyes of a young man and you've got to ascertain who he is, what he is, and what he may become to be able to fit the mold of what you're putting together. So how intricately difficult is that to do? I mean, that's, you've almost become a psychologist in many ways. That is very difficult. It's very, and, and yes, yeah, the most important thing, you know, and uh, when we were recruiting players, when the, you're trying to find out, is there anything bad about him? If there's something bad about him, let's don't bring him in because he'll, rub it off on the other guys, you know? And uh, so uh, you're trying to study these boys, what they're thinking. You're checking with their parents. You're checking with their high school coach. You're checking with their friends and their girlfriend and everything, trying to find out what they are made of, you know, and how how deep their character is, you know, because eventually it's going to get out of that. Everybody, Everybody's got good players, you know? But which players are willing to pay the price the most? How did you decide that in who was willing to pay the price? Well, by observing them and trying to find out as much as you could about them before you commit to them. You know, you're going to check with their coaches. You're going to check with their uh, mom and daddy. You're going to check with their, their buddies and their friends and their girlfriends and see if they meet all the qualifications you really want in a player, you know, because a winner has all of those qualities and you're looking for them and checking them off. You know what? And you, the thing you're trying to do is eliminate the bad stuff because that'll only get you in trouble. Coach Sperrier, how did you do that to eliminate the bad stuff? Well, like Coach Bowden said, uh, you, you have practices and you have off-season, go to class or do they not go to class and so forth. You'll have an idea. And uh, one of the guidelines for successful coaches is if you have a player – that is disruptive to your team. If he loafs and you can't get him to amend his ways and he's just not going to fit in with the team, you got to remove him. And I've had about three players that I've had to call in my office and say, what you're doing is not going to work. And if you can't change your ways, I'm going to have to kick you off the team. Simple as that. So usually they, they'll maybe change their ways, but if not, you got to remove them because uh, whether they say one bad apple can – rotten the whole group and so forth. So uh, you have to remove a player every now and then. Unfortunately, I've not had to do it a lot, but the entire team needs to know, hey, there's some guidelines we've got to follow if we're going to be successful. So that's how I've tried to handle that. I'll throw this out for whomever wants to take it first, but is it possible here in the 21st century that some college coaches are becoming too lenient? And specifically to your point, Coach Sperrier, to where they don't take that action. They don't immediately get on top of the bad apples and weed them out because they're more interested in, in winning. And perhaps there needs to be more of a, an effort by coaches to say, that's it, Fisher cut bait, you're out. So is it not possible that some coaches these days just are way too lenient? I think you'd have to ask somebody else that question. I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable of what all the other coaches do. 
Certainly you read about uh, some coaches had 30 guys arrested and they stayed on the team, things of that nature. But, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not here to condemn other coaches, but uh, I, I'm tell me how I tried to handle those kind of situations. If a player could not get in the program, then we tried to encourage him to transfer and maybe go mess up another team. That was, maybe that was <laughs> That's true. And a lot of coaches were taking now, so he, he would get another opportunity. What do you think, Coach Bowden? I think the same way that, uh, you know, I used to get on a blackboard. I, I guess you know what a blackboard is, don't you? I don't, I don't, <laughs> think, they know, I don't think they know that. Wait, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm, not that, I'm not that old yet. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, I do remember. I don't have my pad here, so I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, we need the boy. But anyway, I used to draw a picture, a basket, and put apples in it. I'd, I'd draw the apples. Then I'd, I'd, I'd color one up. I'd say, this one is rotten. And if we don't get it out of here, he's going to affect all those others. The one next to him, he'll get rotten. And the one next, so we have to get him out of there. I used to do that talking to my players to let them know they've got to stay within the rules of of, of the program, or we're gonna to have to get 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 the apple in there for their place. It's a smart thing to do because you have to let them know exactly where that those, those boundaries are. Let's move then on to the two of you gentlemen, because I and I will now leave it open to whomever wants to take this first. Uh, let's call this um, let's call this Bowden and Spurrier the early years. Uh, who wants to recount the first time that? You two met, well, I mean, obviously you met on the football field, but what was it like the first time you guys got together and, and met off the field? Well, I uh, I admired Steve when he was a player. He caught the attention of the nation when he was a player, and he won the Heisman Trophy at the University of Florida. He built Florida into a winning program which they hadn't, they hadn't had that much success until he came. You know, it thing completely around. And the one, the one big thing I'll always remember about Steve, he taught America, you can win a national championship featuring the passing game. Up until then, everybody thought, oh, no, you got to run the ball. Oh, you can't run a national championship if you can't run the ball. Well, he proved different. He, he, he wanted throwing and then running the football, you know. In history, I won't. <laughs> well, actually, uh, Coach Bowden and SSU were throwing the ball before I got to Florida in 1990. It was just that no teams in the SEC were pitching it around the way uh, uh, Miami and Florida State were throwing it around, much better than, than SEC teams. So I was, I was sort of lucky to get here. When throwing the ball was pretty easy because the other team played about the same coverage every down. Uh, Coach Bell, remember when all you saw was that cover three, occasionally a cover two. Uh, so we, we sort of had a exactly. in the 90s there. And then the defenses, you know, they tried to catch up a little bit and so forth. But uh, uh, Coach Bowden and Florida State were throwing the ball before I came to Florida. We were just sort of one of the first to do it in the SEC. Let's let's talk about that, Coach Spurrier. From your aspect, when you decided to bring and change things at the University of Florida the, to that passing game, when you got there, did you did you see that? Was it a glaring um, hole that you saw and said, "Yeah, I, I get this whole SEC thing. I experienced this as a player. Why are we not passing the ball?" Or or did it just fall into your lap with regard to the type of players that you had available? Well, it had nothing to do with any of that. Uh, when I got into coaching uh, at Duke University, now my background is Duke University football. So if we're going to win enough games at Duke, and I'm going to survive and maybe have a career in coaching that I really love doing, and uh, to me it was not like working when you're a football coach. You know, the games, preparation, and trying to compete against the other guys. So I, I thoroughly loved everything about that. So I wanted to survive as a coach. And uh, as a quarterback, I, I tried to learn all I could about the passing game, pass protection, getting guys open. So I came from Duke University uh, to the football league. 
Uh, John Reeves was our back there for over 4,000 yards back to back years. And then we went back up to Duke uh, uh, and uh, we threw for a yards. So when I got to Florida, that was that was an option. Uh, we knew how to coach, and uh, we had the talent here. To do. Uh, the receivers were here. Shane Matthews was here. It wasn't like uh, let's go recruit for two or three years. And we'll have a good team. No, the players were already here, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get here at the right time, at the right place, uh, to come to my alma mater 30 years ago, 1990. What was it when the two of you got together and, and you first met and, and Coach Sperrier, you came there and Coach Bowden was already uh, uh, entrenched very well at Florida State. When you guys got together to talk about when you weren't on the field, what did you talk about? I mean, I, I can't believe that all you guys talked about is X's and O's. Coach Bowden? We, we wasn't speaking together back. In those days, when I knew I had to play him, I didn't do a whole lot of talking. He didn't either. You know, he just lined up and went at it, boy. We, I, we had, I, I tell you, I, there was a time there where Florida, Florida, Florida State, and Miami were one, two, three in the nation. Sure. I mean, I mean no state in the state of Florida had, you know, and uh, it's what Steve did there at the University of Florida and what uh, the coach did at the University of Miami and what we were able to do at Florida State. It was a, it was a three-man battle there for a while. Coach Sperrier, what is it about, and, and, and when did you sense this, where Florida was becoming that, that national powerhouse? As I said at the beginning of the show, I was lucky enough to be there when you were there, when, when you came along and Coach Bowden was there and Howard Schnellenberger was there at Miami and what he created. But when was that sense that we got something special here? These boys need to stay here in Florida and we have the best talent in America. How did that, how did that start and, and when did you realize that? Coach Spurrier? You to me, right Ed? Okay. Uh, I can still remember the press conference when I took the job. I said, our goal at the University of Florida is to try to be the best in our state. Uh, I didn't say we wanted to beat Alabama or Tennessee or those SEC teams or Georgia. I said, if we can catch up with FSU and Miami, we'll probably be about the best team in the SEC. So our goal was to compete within our state. If we could do that, with all the SEC teams. So that's that's where college football was in the 90s. Uh, many, many weeks, uh, Miami, Florida State, and Florida were in the top five in the country. So um, we, we had three of the best programs going. And uh, unfortunately for Bobby and his guys, they had to play both of us. They played Miami and us. They not to play one of the two. So uh, anyway, uh, it was uh, it was trying to keep up with each other within our state that made us. And obviously, Florida State won the ACC what 14 years in a row, something like that. So when we were keeping up with each other, it made us probably the best in our particular conferences. Coach Bowden, what was the rivalry like between you and Coach Spurrier? Well, the, the biggest rivalry for Florida State was the University of Florida. There's no doubt about it. Uh, they're, 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 what, 170 miles apart uh, in, in a state that's rich, rich with athletic uh, uh, ability. And, uh, and so there's no doubt in my mind, if you took all the Florida State alumni down through the let them vote, who, who, do, who do we dread the most? It would be the University of Florida. Miami would be a close second, but it was Florida number one. Coach Spurrier, with regard to that to that rivalry, when you got here, did you sense that immediately? I mean, certainly you'd been to Florida before. You'd been there as a player. You, you knew everything that was already here. It wasn't something new to you. But did you sense that, that intensity and then how that intensity of that rivalry was growing? Well, yeah, I played in it. So, uh, you were there. And... Uh, and it's, it's a huge rivalry because we are close to each other, and their fans and our fans see each other all the time throughout the year. Uh, we don't see many Miami people in Gainesville or uh, in North Florida and so forth. And uh, so since we're 
pretty much close to each other, I think that adds to, to making it the biggest rivalry uh, within our state. Uh, and of course, we were in the SEC since 1933, so we had some big rivals, uh, especially in Georgia and Auburn, were our two biggest rivals. We weren't in Auburn anymore. They switched up the divisions and all that. Uh, but I would say uh, in the SEC, Georgia's our biggest rival. Uh, obviously, out of conference, uh, the state's the big, biggest rival, certainly. You mentioned the SEC. In years recent, the SEC has become the dominant conference, football conference in America today. The national championship goes through the SEC every single season. When did that happen? And why did that happen? Coach Spurrier, what, what was it that, that pushed that forward to where it just became the conference that very few can keep up with? I think it goes back to recruiting. Somehow or another, uh, Alabama's always number one, 10 of the last 12 years in recruiting. And uh, certainly Georgia's right there. Uh, we're always in the top 10, sometimes top five and so forth. Uh, but I would say prior to uh, oh, about 2000, uh, Florida State and Miami were top five in the nation all the time in recruiting. And then obviously with good coaches and the uh, environment that uh, our schools are in, uh, winning is something that is expected. And it, uh, and it continues year after year when, when those things occur. But I would say the SEC jumped ahead uh, of the rest of the nation in recruiting. Uh, when some of our schools here can go to California and pick out players and go up north and get them, that's, that's when you know uh, Maybe we're getting the best players in the country down here. Coach Bowden, it's interesting. What, what Coach Sperrier said, winning's expected. Uh, is it not fair to say that when it comes to Florida State, Florida, I mean, specifically these two schools, winning is expected. You are not expected to falter. No one expects you to stumble for, for one minute. And it, it seems as if, certainly to me, in covering both of your programs over the years, one stumble, one moment, and there's a cataclysmic shift in, in, in the state of Florida, in, specifically in college football. The pressure on that has got to get to anybody after a while. Yeah, you hate, you hate to say that, but that's what, you're, that's what you're unconsciously trying to create. I want to be so good that they expect us to win, you know. I want to be so good that maybe some teams are – don't want to play us, you know? And uh, so you're trying to build that, you know, and then, then when you get it, by golly, you got to live with it because then all of a sudden you're a bullseye for everybody else. And when it comes to that, that bullseye it, it, itself, do both of you get the sense, and you've both been out of the game now for some time, do both of you get the sense that it is still that way? I mean, both programs have had their ups and their downs in recent years. But, Coach Bowden, do you, get the, do you get the sense that it still is that way? There is still that target, or has it waned and changed a little bit nationally? Well, well nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever. You know, you might put a 10-year winning streak together. That ain't going to last forever. You know, you better enjoy it while you can. And so uh, we're going to have up years, and we're going to have down years, right, you know? And uh, uh, so we, we've had our up years, and maybe we and, and trying to live up to that every year is kind of tough, boy. You know, you, your alumni expect you to do it, but uh, as, as a football coach, you realize, boy, this is tough. Coach Spurrier, there's a good word in there that the Coach Bowden used, the alumni. You can't live like that forever, and you, you certainly can't win. So as you sit back and look for other programs, what kind of suggestions do you have for them when they are going to hit the speed bumps and the alumni is going to get a little bit uh, uh, testy, if, if, if you will? Ed, that's just a part of sports, in my opinion. Uh, everybody can't win. We all know that. Uh, some, some school, some team, some coaches uh, maybe have a little extra advantage in being able to inspire their players or maybe can recruit a little bit better, maybe can hire assistant coaches, whatever, and, and you can keep it going. You can keep the run going. But uh, 
but it will run out eventually. Uh, I guess the question a lot of people have when uh, Nick Saban leaves Alabama, where they go down. Well, they, they were down a bit uh, in the uh, early 2000, uh, sorry, around the early 2000s and so forth. They weren't very good. I uh, had a chance to do them back then. But uh, again, uh, that's just the way life is. Uh, there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers. You, you can't even tie anymore. So uh, they're, they're going to fire coaches. It's just the way life is. And you're not going to change that. If everybody wants to win. If nobody wants to win, uh, nobody comes sit up in the stands and pay thousands of dollars to their school. So it's, uh, it's, it's called competition. And, uh, you know, the winner smiles and enjoys life better than the loser. Always to the victor go the spoils. You you mentioned money in there, so let me bring that up. Uh, there is There are a tremendous amount of conversations right now regarding the amount of money in college athletics, and it is stymied. It, it, is, it is astounding the amount of money that's here. Um, Coach Spurrier, I'll begin with you on this one. Is it finally time to pay the athletes in college football, in college athletics? Well, I don't know if you know, but I started that back in about 2011-12 about giving uh, college players approximately well, $3,000 a year, just enough to maybe help their parents come to the game, maybe help their parents get a motel room uh, on the road when they travel to watch their son play. And, uh, and we did get that passed eventually. Uh, it may be time now to double that $3,000 to $6,000. Uh, we've got this uh, imminent lightning to do coming up uh, pretty soon that players could uh, enforce products and make an unlimited amount of money. I, I think we've got to wait and see how that uh, too far. Uh, but I do think uh, the money that we're giving athletes now, scholarship athletes, maybe it's time to double that for television money and come in the college grade. Coach Bowden, I'll throw it to you then. Time to pay them a little bit more money? Well, they do. They deserve it. They, they, but they deserve all they can get. You know what? But I think the big thing that keeps them from getting it, you've got all those other sports. You know, you got, you got 20 varsity sports at your school. You, you're going to pay for the football players, but you're not going to pay the baseball players or the basketball players or the women's teams, you know. And uh, so it, it, it becomes so costly when you get to considering the whole athletic program that uh, that uh, they have to kind of go slow on that. You know, do they do, do the players deserve it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Will they get it? Not, I don't know. Not Maybe not during my lifetime. Of course, everybody ain't my old, as old as I am. <laughs> you better stop that right now. We're not putting up with any of that. There's none of this, none of this age talk here right now. Because when you're talking college football, everything is ageless. Let Let's remember yeah, that. Boy. Yeah, that's good. Let's 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 talk about you, you gentlemen now, because I, I want to make sure, and then I want to talk about some other things you're involved in here. Um, when you you met, you, you spent time throughout the years, you competed against each other. Coach Bowden, is it possible to be exceptionally competitive against someone and still be friends? Yeah, it should be that way. You know, in other words, you're competitive on the field. Once they kick off, you're competitive. But as far as not being friendly off the field and when you're t meeting together, you, you don't want that. You know what? And I, I think Steve and I got along. We, you know, Steve and I got, in my opinion, we got along pretty damn good. Now the press didn't want it to look like that, you know. They wanted, they wanted a war going on. But uh, I've always respected him. I hope he respects me. But, uh, uh, but anyway, that's why I wish he did. Be. Did, did the press do a lot of that, Coach Bowden? I mean, you you just mentioned that. I mean, certainly the press is and the media is always about creating. Uh, good guys and bad guys. So in your opinion, are they the ones that kind of drove this a little bit farther than it should have gone? They're not interested in the good guys. <laughs> they're, they're not interested in the good guys. All they want to know about is the bad guys. You know what? It sells more papers. <laughs> you agree with that, Coach Spurrier? Yeah, that's probably the truth. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Coach Bell and I got along well. We, uh, you know, during the course of some big games we had, uh, obviously, 
you know, some stuff sometimes can happen in the game and it, you get rubbed the wrong way. But when it's over, I'm like Coach Bob, and you shake hands with the other team, and we go back to Gainesville, they go back to Tallahassee, and and, and then we look forward to playing against them the next year. That's the way it should be. I want to get to a couple of things here, and I want our audience, both on our video and also on our audio podcast, to hear a couple of things that I want to get involved in here and, and be able to, to present. First of all, I'm going to go to Coach Bowden. I, I will personally, I will never forget a, a, a game you played at the Orange Bowl, and it was a 10 to 9 loss. And at that point, uh, I was a young uh, radio reporter. And if you remember the Orange Bowl at that point, the, the press, the, the locker room was a concrete bunker almost outside of the door. And you had lost the game, and I'll, and I'll never forget you just sitting there in a chair going, Dad Gummit, I just don't know what happened. I, 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 I don't know what happened. I, I just, I, and, and you were, you, you, every piece of emotion was pouring out of you at that point. And that's the moment I remembered to myself, this is a man who cares. And number two, he really does say dad gummit. Because, because I had somebody swear to me one time. They said, Coach Bowden never said dad gummit in his life. I said, yes, he did. I was there. I was there when he said it. You, I've never met a coach. Coach Bowden, who left as much of his emotions in front of people as you did. It, 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 it was an astounding thing to watch. You know, it's probably true in all coaches. They, people don't, unless you have coached at my level and Steve's level, you don't realize how much a loss hurts. I mean, man, our whole future is built around winning, you know, and to lose a ball game, especially 10 to 9, you know, one point, uh, it, it's tough, boy. I mean, you you got to live with it all week, play another ball game. Maybe you can forget it or, or push it in the background, you know. But uh, people who have never coached on our level have no idea how bad it hurts to lose. Now, my, I, I played not to lose. I, I mean, not to – yeah, I played not to – I, I won't lose, man, you know. And uh, that, that hurts – Worse, worse, maybe then winning feels good. <laughs> Spurrier, how did you how did you handle it? I mean, I, I remember a lot of times during losses, you were much different when when it came to dealing with losses. Your your emotional level seemed to be very much in check at the time when you did it. How did you handle that? Oh, I don't know how uh, so well. I know that uh, it seemed. Let's put it this way: the, the perception was you were handling. You were angry. You got angry after a loss. You could tell. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but losing is going to happen. Losing is going to happen. And uh, and actually, Coach Bowden's had more tough, tough losses, I think, than most all of us. I was lucky to be a head coach 30 years. And you always look back and look at But we had some close wins. Also. But uh, Coach Bowden had some tough ones. You know, when, when the field goal guy misses uh, – I don't know, was it four or five of those uh, games that could have been won against Miami? And they were big. They national championship implications. And, uh, you know, I've lost a few like that, but uh, I, I think Coach Bowden might have had more tough luck in those kind of games than most coaches because he, he had so many great teams all those years there. So I tried to justify it with the attitude, hey, going to win some close ones and lose some close ones. But, you know, it's sort of a fact of life. Some coaches are sort of luckier or whatever in those close games, and they win more than – and maybe they lose. I don't know. But, uh, no, it hurts. It hurts. Uh, you know, shake it off and get ready for the next one. How long did it take you to get over a loss? I mean, r- right away? I mean, some coaches I know say, it's gone, it's over. I, I-, I find that hard to believe. Oh, I'm, I'm still going back. If and then button if we'd won this one or that one and, and this one and that one. Uh, but you can't get them back. So, you to get them back. so uh, it's hard to do. So, uh, yeah, I can tell you the score about every loss I had for 12 years at Florida. And I, I mean, I'm sure Coach Fox can probably tell you the scores too because he didn't have many losses either. But, uh, no, they hurt. But you have to, you have to regroup and move on. You, you learn from losses. Great coaches taught me this. Don Shula taught me this over the years when he sat me down and said, if you don't learn from a loss, then you have learned nothing. 
that you must learn from your defeats. True. And, and I think too often we're hung up on wins in this country. You learn from victory. No, you don't. You learn from the moment when you are beaten down under the ground somewhere and somebody has taken the best of you. And then you have to, you have to rise yeah. to be better. Part of that is what the two yeah. of you gentlemen are involved in that I want to make sure we talk about. When you the, lose, it's hard to say when you lose, you, when you lose, you won't know why. When you win, you don't, you, everybody's happy. You know, well, how much, how much you time did you, you spend you. then? How much time did you spend then, Coach Bowden, on, on when you lost, figuring out why? Did you really spend that much time? Well, how long ago did Miami beat us 26 to 25 for the national championship? How long ago? How long ago was that? I ain't forgot that yet. <laughs> okay, so that sticks in your craw. Coach Sperrier, what loss sticks in your craw to this day? Uh, I was thinking about one this morning. Uh, we lost at FSU in 98. Uh, I think it ended up 23 to 12. Uh, we were recovering a fumble in the end zone, and our, it squirted out, and FSU got it and only got a safety. And I think uh, their quarterback, guy, kid named Rooster, what was his name, Coach? The quarterback you had in 98 at FSU? Yeah, yeah, yeah his nickname was Rooster. Yeah. But anyway, he threw a pass that our guy was, I think, had an interception, went through his hands, and FSU receiver caught it and ran for a touchdown. Anyway, we got beat. We got to be in one game. We would have played Tennessee for the national championship. And Bobby and his guys got to play Tennessee. And, uh, and I, I, Coach Brown would probably tell you that 98 team he had, it wasn't quite as great as a lot of the teams he had. But they were they were one game away from winning the national championship. And uh, I, I, I just think we could have beaten Tennessee if we had got to that game. So... That, that was one that I was thinking about this morning for whatever reason. And for anybody who thinks that losses don't sit in coaches' craws, there's your answer. I want to make sure we talk about Florida Rising Stars because both of you gentlemen are involved in this program. And it is a it is something that has been long overdue. Um, I was contacted, Coach Bowden, originally by Wayne Hogan, your former sports information director who's involved in it. And Wayne and I have been friends for many years. And we have been talking about this, but you both are ambassadors for the Florida Rising Stars. And what I think is fascinating about this, and I'll get this to you first, Coach Bowden, what's involved in here is preparing these kids for more than just an athletic career, which is necessary. Teach them about the marketing side. Teach them about the sport itself. There's broadcasting involved. Is it not fair to say that something like this, its time has come to where we need to prepare our high school athletes for more than just playing the game. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, yeah. I think they 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 have. You know, you you don't want, you don't want them to make football their god. I mean, you can't don't, don't worship football, son. Don't worship football. It's a game. You know, it's great fun. It's great experience. It's tough though. You're going to have to be tough if you're going to play it, you know what? But don't make it your God where you, that you're going to die if you lose. I, no, I, I, I don't remember a single game we ever played. I'd rather die than, than, than lose that dead damn ball game. But, uh, but uh, anyway, that's something just something to think about. Well, I, I think it's worthwhile. And, and Coach Sparrier, is it not fair to say that that is, again, part of the educational process as time goes on and as we evolve? We need to be able to have something like this because I think Coach Bowden makes a great point. There are young men, young women who grow up, and to them, athletics is absolutely everything. There is nothing else. They, they do not prepare, whether it's coaches, whether it's teachers, whether it's parents, whether it's friends, whatever. They don't get them ready for life. And if they're not ready for life, we're not doing the job as, as educators, and, and which in many ways coaches are, correct? Exactly, Ed, and I tell you what, I'm I'm proud and honored to be part of the uh, Rising Stars project uh, here in our state. I'm sure Coach Bowden is also, and uh, not only uh, does this project offer instruction in a lot of the sports, uh, football, uh, bas baseball, and I think also soccer, uh, but also in broadcasting, uh, marketing, uh, maybe even sports officiating. There's a lot of things going on. But I always just try to encourage uh, 
young, very old girl, a young first to de develop a wonderful attitude and take you further in life and make an honor roll every year. So when you have that wonderful attitude that you can give a you say yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, you, you can go a long way in life. So uh, just encourage all the high school kids in our state to be involved with the Rising Star Project and uh, just develop a wonderful attitude and everything you do. We all can't be football, basketball, or baseball players, but uh, we can all be the best we can be. And if you'll do that, you'll be successful in life. Do we not and is it not important for coaches at your level, but at every level, at the prep level, at the Pop Warner level, at the high school level, uh, whatever, to think of themselves as educators as much as coaches? Because it's that educator side that then will prepare these kids for life after football. I mean, Coach Bowden, if we don't prepare them for that, aren't we failing them? Yeah, that's the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. And I think probably most coaches look at it that way, that I've got to help develop this young man to, gr to grow into manhood and be successful in life. You know, but athletics, especially football, where the competitive is, is tough and you get knocked down, you get hurt. You know, you got to come back. You learn so many lessons that are going to help you throughout life if you let it, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's that. that I, you know, the biggest thrill I get nowadays. Now I coach fifty-seven years at the college level at different schools. I get letters all the time from players uh, that I coached thirty years ago, forty years ago. None of them mention football. None of them say, "Oh, coach, you remember when I ran this way for a touchdown?" Or coach, you remember when I did this? Or they, none of them mention that. They thank me. They, they say something like, Coach, I'm married. My, I've got two children in college, and uh, they're, they're, they're going to get their education. I want to thank you for blank, 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 blank. You know what? Those are the great – those are maybe the greatest rewards you get, Coach. I, 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 I'm, I love hearing this because I don't hear this from enough coaches, and that's why when – when they asked, when Wayne approached me and we started talking about the Florida Rising Stars, I said, you guys have got something here where, where finally we have something where we need to prepare these kids for what's going on after. And, I'm, and I cannot think of two gentlemen who are better to do it than the two legends in the state of Florida when it, when it comes down to, to college coaching. Hell, I wish this would have been around when I was in school. I'd have felt a whole lot better. Damn it. Maybe I wouldn't have went into broadcasting then or at least, well, <laughs> so one thing I want to do with broadcasters, I want to teach them at, at Florida Rising Stars. I want to say, don't ask a stupid question. Here, I'm going to teach you how to ask a really smart question. Don Shula is another one that Shula taught me. He took me aside one day after somebody had asked him a stupid question in the press conference. And he said, I want you to remember that question. That was really stupid. <laughs> and I can only imagine how many that, that you guys have been asked. I don't even want to get into that. That, that, that could take us a whole show. Coach Spurrier, I also want to point out that you are involved in, in something which I think is really about time. It is about time that people were able to go to Gainesville and able to go to a game and be able to sit basically in Steve Spurrier's house, quote unquote house. Um, you are now involved in the Gridiron Grill, which you're going to open up in early 2021 here. Here's a, here's a quick look inside the Gridiron Grill, which is getting ready to open. What do you hope this brings to Gainesville, aside from good food and places? Yeah, we hope it gives uh, the Gators and other people a place to come uh, during the week or noontime or what have you, and, uh, and have fun, be uh, an enjoyable place to dine, and uh, maybe watch some ball games, uh, so, or after ball games. Uh, you know, Celebration Point, where we are now, it's where the Gators come to celebrate. So uh, hopefully we can have some uh, nice celebrations there, really for all the sports, not just football, but uh, baseball, basketball, uh, the women's sports. It seems like the women are always winning a bunch of championships. So that would be a good place to celebrate those. Is this something you've always wanted to do? Where did the idea come from? Actually, it came a little bit from my daughter, Amy. Uh, she said, Dad, you need to have a restaurant where you put all your trophies. They've run out of your house. When they're in your house, nobody sees them. 
I said, I've been blessed to, you know, have some trophies here, there, the other, some uh, championship, uh, SEC championships here. We've got seven of those and one national and, and some other things. So this will give me a place to put uh, those awards and trophies uh, for everybody to see. We really love our location here, Celebration Point, right off the interstate, and Archer Road, and so forth. So, uh, but it's, it, we still got a little time. It's not going to open until March of 21. So, we got a little time before we get into it. And uh, looking forward to our lounge. The Visor's Lounge is uh, up top of the restaurant, open air. Uh, I think you can see the stadium from there, and so forth, and you certainly can see the highway. Uh, so, I'm looking forward to sitting up there a little bit. Boy, I gotta tell you, there is the height of modesty. I've got some trophies. <laughs> Coach Ferrier, when you said that, I, I, I fell over. I said, are you kidding? You've got through three warehouses of trophies. And and I and I wanna point out that we're breaking a story here today, in case you don't know. Coach Ferrier is actually going to be the master chef. He is going to prepare all your meals by hand. Uh, he, he's been doing this his whole life, and no one's known this, where he is an actual five-star chef, Michelin-guided chef. So, uh, Coach, it's, it's, it's going to be wonderful to see as you prepare all the food. I'm going to get hammered for this one. <laughs> My wife, Jerry, could be the master chef, but uh, no, we've, uh, we've got one of the best in the country uh, that's going to run our restaurant there and so forth. But I'm yeah, really looking forward to the opening show. <laughs> First, second weekend. It's uh, really a classic. Probably casual, we call it restaurant. Or maybe Saturday afternoon and Saturday night. It may look a bit like a sports bar. But overall, it's a first class restaurant. Excellent location. Celebration Point is right off Interstate 75 on Archer Road. So it's easy to get in and out of there. And uh, we're really looking forward to spending a lot of time at Gridiron Grill. Uh, Coach Bowden, why has there never been a Bobby Bowden's restaurant? I, I don't know enough about it. <laughs> I, I, if I'm ever able, I'm going to slip down there and go in his restaurant. Though I know, I know it'll be good. Oh no, it's it, there, there. There has to be a, there has to be a gathering there. We're going to have to arrange that one. Oh, and by the way, Coach, <laughs> Coach Sperrier, will you please just promise me? I mean, you mentioned everything. You talked basketball. Will you carry hockey? For an old hockey guy, is that okay? Oh you... yeah, I'm sure one of the TVs will have the Stanley Cup on, maybe. Okay, as, as long as <laughs> one. Bay Lightning, yeah, they're. Uh, I think they won it this past year, didn't they? Tampa well, Bay yeah, Lightning. you know, it's <laughs> Tampa Bay won it, but you see, careful. I'm a Boston Bruins fan, and we yeah. hate the Lightning, so and got to be careful right now. I, I I get that, but as long as you can put the games on. Uh, before we leave, I want to leave with this. You both are wonderful storytellers. We could do, we could tell stories forever with the two of you on football and off football. However, Coach Sperrier, I, I think you will agree with me that when it comes to weaving stories, there simply is nobody who probably has a, a larger collection of, of stories than Coach Bowden, who has regaled us over the years with so many different stories that have absolutely nothing to do with football. So I, I think it apropos that before we leave, we, we make sure that, that Coach Bowden tells us a little bit of what it's like on the road. About a month ago, I was been over to Panama City and I was coming through Quincy on the way to Tallahassee and I came, I, I, I was going 35 miles an hour and that thing clicked, flashed, I saw it. It took my dad gum picture. <laughs> yeah, and took my tag, you know. And I said, what in the world's going on? I was going 35 miles an hour. And that thing took my picture. So I went around the blo block again, cut it to 30. Click. Got me twice, man. <laughs> I went around another time. Click. I said, man, this there's something wrong. I ended up going around five times. <laughs> It took my picture every time I saw it. I got out of my car. I pointed at that camera. I said, I ain't paying y'all nothing. <laughs> this is a dadgum ripoff. Y'all just I got in my car and took off, you know, to Tallahassee, Florida. Well, a month, about two weeks later, I get a letter from the sheriff's office in Quincy. I got five tickets for not wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> 
coach, when are you going to coach? Brown, when are you going to take your stories and put them in a book? I, I tell you what, we'll do. We'll, we'll do it on video here. I'll just we'll, we'll set it up, and you can just tell two hours of stories. We'll put it out there. We'll put a sponsor on it. We'll make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could talk that long, boy. Are you? I don't know that. Are you kidding? I don't know that many. <laughs> Are you kidding? You could definitely do it. That, that, there's stop. That that's not even a problem, gentlemen. Uh, this this has been for me a, a a marvelous time to spend with the two of you. I've had the honor of covering you both, covering your programs, interviewing you. Coach Bowden is the one person, when I used to do a radio show in Miami, my producer would say, we, 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 we need to get some." I said, call Coach Bowden's house. We would call Coach Bowden's house. He would answer the phone, and he would say, hello, uh, Coach, it's uh, it's uh, Mike Stefanelli was our producer at the time. It's Ebra Leonard. Can you, can you do a show? What time do you need me, boy? I said, uh, how, about, uh, how about 2 o'clock this afternoon? All right, you give me a call. Are you kidding? Trying to get an interview these days with a coach, you got to go through 17 different layers of. You know, I basically have to give a blood sample to, to, to get a uh, to get an interview. But Coach Bowden was always there, and Coach Spurrier and his office always there whenever we needed interviews to talk about the game. Marvelous people that you guys dealt with over the years. It was really fun. Uh, I want to remind everybody again that Florida Rising Stars. Go to FloridaRisingStars.com. Facebook and Twitter is at Florida Rising Stars. And you can find out more about it there. Both of the gentlemen here today are ambassadors for Florida Rising Stars. And they will be helping the youth of today learn about tomorrow and get themselves ready for what is, is coming down the pike when they really absolutely need it more than more than ever before. And it's, it's a marvelous job. Coaches, I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, Bobby, it's great to see you healthy again and, and great to see everything worked out. Um, God bless you and your family, wonderful people. Coach Spurrier, uh, Steve, uh, congratulations with the restaurant and everything else. And I hope everybody flocks there. And um, and I know there's got to be Gator. Wait, do you serve Gator in a, in a Gator-themed restaurant? I just thought that. Yes. We haven't talked about that too much yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but all of a sudden I'm thinking, do you serve gator to the gators? I mean, that itself might, might be a problem. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I hope we get to do it again. Uh, the best to you and your families. Thank you again. Good seeing you, Coach Bowden. All thank right. you very much. Yes, congratulations, Steve, on a great uh, thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. We're going to have, by the way, uh, before we leave, we're going to have a reunion. One of the neatest things for a coach is like 20 or 25 years after you've won a championship or whatever, you get to see your players with their families. And we're going to have a 25-year reunion of our 95 and our 96 teams. Uh, they both went 12-1, and one, number one and number one. So I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going That's to be a September 25 Tennessee game weekend. So if you've done a good job as a coach, and I know Coach Bowden feels the same way, your players will want to come back and hang out with their coach and introduce him to their children. So I'm looking forward to all of that happening in September this year. What a great idea. We got we to gotta get a couple of cameras there. We got to put this up live. <laughs> we got we got to do this for a YouTube audience to be able to see that. That in itself would be awesome. Uh, we'll, we'll be in touch then, gentlemen. Thanks so much. Be well to you and your families. Take care. Thank Absolute you. Legends between Steve Spurrier and Bobby Bowden. It has been a pleasure to spend time with them. Don't forget Florida Rising Stars, and don't forget to make sure there is always an opportunity to help kids down the road and make their lives better. For Bobby Bowden. For Steve Spurrier, for everybody here, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, go to welcometothearena.com and subscribe to all of our shows right there and catch us all on all of the major podcast platforms. I'm Ed Berliner. Rock on, True Believers. See you. You're still here? Are you not entertained? It's over. All right. Hey. All right. Good job, guys. Uh, let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Go home. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Go! That's all, folks.